The things I will be talking about probably are not very usual to hear from me now, because usually I have like meetings with people and talk about, you know, you know, civil society, about culture, about political things in my country. But I decided when I was asked, was asked to talk here to choose something different and to talk to, about history, science, technology, everything together. Um, I started this, this sort of presentation, I started thinking about that during my uh, semester at Yale University two years ago, uh, one year and a half ago. So on one of the seminars, I proposed the idea 20 inventions that changed the world. And it was somehow popular, we had a big argument after that. So I thought it out afterwards, I, I added some stuff. So now uh, I'll try to talk about these 20 inventions that changed the world. And as you say, that pushed boundaries. It's not only innovations, it's just some, some of them are innovations, some of them are discoveries, some of them are just inventions by chance, you know, or, or as Dima says, by accident. Some good things are happening by accident somehow. And uh, mm, some of them are probably will be, uh, you know, argued by your, by, by, by your audience and can be, you know, let's find, let's find a compromise at the end. So I'm very, very happy that you're here. I know that this is a very intelligent audience and I will be very short, probably 20 to 25 minutes or 30 minutes maximum. Then probably you'll ask me some questions on what you've heard. And then probably you can ask me some questions about everything. I'm very, very much free to answer everything. And I'll be all ears. So we'll start from these 20 inventions. One thing, I'm, I, it's a shame that I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, but you know, I, I really didn't have time to to, to make it. Also, I'm not very strong in PowerPoint. Always my PA, Anya, does it for me. And we were in tour, so I just, all I have is very, very old school stuff. <laughs> and uh, if you want to, like, to learn by heart the things they'll tell you, or just, just put down some, some things in your, in your notebooks, so it will be great. So when we talk about these inventions and about innovations that changed or created what a human being is now, uh, I think one should think out of the box. So we're not going to talk about just technological breakdowns or breakthroughs or technological you know, revolutions or just some devices. Because many of us, when we talk about Today, when, when we hear about inventions, we're thinking about, you know, laptops or computers or uh, smartphones or, or electrical cat cattles, name it. But things are more interesting and everything starts from the very beginning. In my, in my point of view, probably the, the biggest invention that was made by human being, even before we started to name ourselves Homo sapiens was an invention of hot food. Hot food is something unique because, you know, we are only animals in the world that consume hot food. And as you probably know, hot food is much easier to digest. And when we started actually eating, I think it was also by accident, eating meat that was baked literally in some, you know, charcoal or just, just, you know, I don't know how that happened. But we started doing it and we understood, once we, we got more energy to save and that energy went to, trans, uh, it transformed to, to, to sugar and that sugar went to our brain and our brain started to, to grow and it increased and actually hot food, most scientists argue, was much more responsible for making our brains bigger than even the, the fact that we uh, walk on our two legs, which is also very important. But that's something that we didn't create. But this innovation to eat hot food, that I, I think it started the whole process of creating of human being today. And uh, 
from that, it, uh, it allowed us to, to proceed. The second very serious innovation or this, like, you know, invention is language. A language, uh, not only language like communication, but what human beings, homo sapiens, were able to derive from this language. As you probably know, before homo sapiens ruled the world, there were other, other homos who, who inhabited our world. These were like Neanderthals, homo habilis, uh, like, you know, homo, even there was homo deniso, you know, who it was a special, special species of, of homos who were living in Siberia. All of them don't exist anymore. Human beings, homo sapiens, you know, conquered everything, ruled the world. They unfortunately exterminated 80% of all living creatures in the world. Even before scientific industrial revolutions, we did it 20, 30 thousand years ago. So language, which human beings or homo sapiens used, differed from language other homos or even animals used. You know, animals can communicate. For example, they can say that there is danger, there is, you know, whatever, like there is water there, so some, some, some primitive things. Uh, Neanderthals, they also used hot food, so their brains also were bigger than animals, and they, some, some say that even bigger than homo sapiens brains. But then, but their language was still this kind of primitive and very straightforward. What Homo sapiens created was an abstract thinking and language that used w notions and like, you know, ideas that actually do not exist. So that was our strength. So we used language to describe things that actually don't exist. For well, there is one very, very in interesting book. You can read it. It's, uh, it says, uh, I think it's Homo sapiens and something. I don't remember. I, at the end, at the end, I will give you a name because I just don't remember. But they have a good fact there that that you know the Neanderthals could communicate in a way that you know there is a lion and this lion is dangerous. We should aware of it, and and that's it. Like dangerous lion, we fight him or we you know escape or we hide. But what Homo sapiens made. They went further. They said they created things like, you know, lion can be a symbol of our forest, or lion is a defender of our forest, which actually, from the power, from the point of matter of fact, is a bullshit. I mean, lion cannot be anybody but lion. But human beings somehow created this kind of abstract thinking, and their language allowed them to, you know, imagine things that don't exist. That consequently led to, um, to like, you know, myths and religion, and then actu that actually made possible to gather large groups of people, much more than hundreds of people, but even thousands of people together. You cannot stick together just because, you know, you live in some, some, some area, because people lived with small, you know, in small tribes, uh, 100, 200 people, but when you share the common beliefs or the common things, like for example, that a lion is a master of the forest, it makes you, your bodies in the other forest, understandable. And you can communicate, and then that makes strong bonds. And actually this made Homo sapiens so powerful. They could create tribes not of hundreds of people, but thousands of people. And that's how they, I think, literally exterminate, exterminated all, all their rivals. So that will be the second fundamental uh, creation, uh, invention, which is, which is uh, language and abstract thinking. The third is the only one I didn't include in my previous list, but in the argument that we had afterwards, I, uh, it came up to my head that probably it was a very important one, and I should include into the list, it's money. Because Money actually created interaction between all human beings, con continuous interaction. It's a sort of, it's also a, a sort of myth or a sort of religion, because money is actually an abstract thing. It doesn't exist as, 
as we understand, because it's, it's, it's not a material thing, but it created something that all people believed in. And actually, probably it's the only religion that all seven or eight billion people believe in today. And that's something that, that can, like, like look, look at that. You can, you can argue about whether, whether Christianity or um, like, you know, Islam or some other religions are better or some people don't believe in God, but nobody argues about money. I mean, it's very hard to find somebody except Shaolin monks who just don't use money and, you know, and money changed, changed everything. Money changed behavior of people and they made them more, when we say materialistic, it's not only bad thing. It's materialistic, it's, it's something that you, you become cautious. Money makes people cautious. And probably it also preserved us from doing or making some, some big mistakes at the beginning of our history. Also money are unfortunately pushing us to make big, big mistakes, huge mistakes now in this part, part of our history. But anyway, money is number three. Number four is writing. And writing is, is obvious invention, but many things existed before writing. For example, uh, oral narratives you know, allowed people to have, once again, religion, to have myths, to have tales, fairy tales, to have everything. But what created really writing, it created very important things like law and science. Because law is something that should be you cannot treat it very free in a very free way. You should know it very, like for sure, how to use this law. And narrative is very rarely, you know, strict and precise. Narrative can be, you know, I can say you what law is. You will say this, like, you know, to to somebody else, the same thing, but with distortion. And finally, somebody, not in this room, but in the other room, will completely hear the different thing. So writing allows us to see the same things. And when we create judiciary system, when we talk about law, it's a must to, to know exactly the same that other people know about these laws. Suddenly science and history also started to develop because, because you know, you also uh, save a lot of your memory, not for you know remembering all the things that all your ancestors created, but just doing all your mundane and routine stuff, knowing that you can find it somewhere, a library or whatever. Suddenly, at the beginning of creation of writing, there were only few people in the world, a few, like a small percentage of the world, who had an access to this, you know, to this um, uh, cave with, with, uh, with pressure, but uh, with precious gems or whatever, how we call knowledge. But generally, it started changing the world as well. And the fifth, in my opinion, is we already talked about religion. We could say that religion is an invention, but religion wasn't a true invention because religion, it took us thousands of years, more and more and more, to come from just primitive beliefs to myths to fairy tales and then to religion as we know it. But there was one concrete and one specific invention when we talk about religion, which really changed the history and the, like, you know, the path of, of development of human being, which is monotheism. Because monotheism, which was created, some argue, in Egypt at the end, end of their you know, ruling 1,200 years before Christ, some say that it was created by Jewish people, when they created Judaism, we don't actually now need to understand exactly. What we need to understand is that for the first time in history, abstract thinking, you know, soared up that high that people created the idea of invisible and transcendent God, which, who is omnipotent and who also is, you know, uh, very, you know, you know God cannot do bad things. That's a bad, I, that's a big, big uh, difference from religion that we had before. For example, if you say, if you talk about Greek gods, Greek gods were very much like people. 
they behaved like people, they cheated, they killed, they, they, you know, they did all the sins that we people do. And actually, in ancient pre-monotheism culture, it was still bad to kill people or to do some bad stuff. But it was bad just mostly because when you, you knew that you, when, you, you, when you killed people, when you killed somebody, you would be killed as well, or you would be punished because you deprived some family of labor force, or whatever. But monotheism and Judaism and then Christianity and Islam created moral. So when we started believing that to kill or to steal or to cheat is not bad just because you violate some law, but it's bad because it's bad. And it's something that makes your psyche suffer and makes your soul suffering, and you you feel bad. And actually, this is very obvious and very, like, you know, very, uh, yeah, it's an obvious thing now. So what about that? We can think that moral existed for all over the time, but it's not, but it doesn't. It didn't. It, it exists only for two or 3,000 years. Before that, moral was different if it existed at all. So what we now have we behave not only in a practical way, and not only in an instinctive way. Instinctive way is the way of animals. Practical way is something that human being created, even before monotheism emerged. But what we call spiritual way, or way of a conscious, is something that this idea of, that was probably first, or one of the first time described in, in Mm, Ten Commandments, which we know from the Bible, is, is, some, is a fundamental thing. It also gave people a freedom of choice. So it, it uh, described a human being as a creature which was you know, granted uh, by God with freedom of choice. And freedom of choice either to violate commandments or not, to do this or to do that, so we are free to do whatever we know we want, but we know that at the end we'll pay the price for that, or we'll you know we'll be rewarded for that. It it, it changed human beings' behavior, uh, I think, for for good because because uh, now we're different people than we were two or three thousand years ago. So these five inventions, I think, they are the most important because they. Uh, Actually, they framed what we are now, and they framed our development for the next thousand years. The inventions I'm, I will be talking late, later, they are more practical, but they, couldn't, uh, they wouldn't be possible without these five. Fire gun weapon, it's much, much later. I put it as an invention. Uh, as a separate invention, I'm not talking about cold weapon, because cold weapon, you know, even animals, even apes use, use you know, stones for fighting. And it took us like thousands of years to come to good swords and, you know, and to, to, to have like, you know, all these, these uh, uh, like weapon of destruction that Greeks and Romans and Chinese used. But what fire gun weapon did, it equalized uh, possibilities and uh, military power of you know rivals or enemies of of people who fight each other of states who, who fight each other and as you know fire gun weapon although it was it was created in china but mostly developed uh, the at the beginning of the end of middle ages and beginning of renaissance in in europe and finally it came uh, to the point when wars became unbearable. So at the beginning, a big country with a, a lot of you know, military force could conquer easily a smaller country. And just because they, were, they came with their horses and their swords, and it was very difficult to, to fight them. But then, with fire guns and with mortars and with uh, like, you know, all, all these cannons, it's much easier to uh, defend yourself. And the last war that showed us the like, 
probably impossibility of 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 a former of a former order was a 30 years war in Europe that finally ended up with Westphalian peace, which created modern states. Because modern states is is something that we understand as granted, although some people question this now, even in 2000s, we know about that. But modern state is a state with, with borders, which is respected by other states, no matter how small or how weak it is. Once it's recognized, it's recognized. Before 30 years war, there was no notion like that. Empires could do whatever they wanted. Big kingdoms, they conquered smaller kingdoms and acquired them and did everything. But now, after Westphalia peace in 1648, people started treating states differently. And the main reason for that was that to fight wars was, became very, very difficult and costful and, and just two million people died during these three, th uh, three decades and nobody won, nobody. It was still status quo. So they just came to, to, to the point when they say we need to, st to start from the very beginning. So if not the fire gun, we wouldn't have had that. Afterwards, some scientific stuff. The printing, printing led to Protestantism and as a consequence, to scientific and industrial revolution in northern countries. Because printing made us, made knowledge affordable, both in figurative and, and direct meaning. We started reading books massively. We started reading books in our languages. They, start, they got printed. And it was much easier to read books, you know, than before. You didn't need to know Latin. And you didn't need to go to the church to ask for permission. You just, if you were, more in, enough, you know, I don't know, had enough money, you could buy these books. And in 200 years after printing was invented, uh, Northern Europe was already, a you know, booming and developing technologies and science. Then discovery of America by Europeans uh, also changed the framework and also changed the, what world is now. You know that probably Chinese would have, would have, could have discovered America. They actually started, uh, you know, creating expeditions during 15th century, but they ab then abruptly stopped them. Nobody knows why. Their, their ships were much bigger. Their potency was much like, stronger. Magnitude of their, you know, you know escadras was, was like, you know, a way better than these first Columbus ships, but they were really small. But somehow European managed to do that, and finally it created, it led to creation of big European empires, which, who, who afterwards, uh, through missionaries and also trade companies, um, first enforced the whole world to accept, and then probably also promoted with, with much uh, milder means European way of thinking, mindset, and actually attitude to life. And nowadays, we still have the societies with, who think different, but mostly European, or I would say, like, you know, Northern European practical way of treating life is dominating in the world now. And who knows if Chinese would, uh, if Chinese discovered America, what the world would have been now. We don't know. We just know that it was Europeans, it was Columbus, and finally, it's an, it's, it's, it's an interesting Europe, uh, irony and, and very important uh, historical irony. You probably know that Columbus, uh, wa it was possible to organize this expedition because Columbus came to Spanish kings Ferdinand and Isabella in 1492, it was the third time he asked them for money. Two times before, they refused. And 1492, they say, OK, we'll give you money. We have money now. Who knows why? Some of you know why it was like 1492? Why they couldn't do that 1483 or something? That was exactly the year that uh, Spanish kings finally reconquered the last part of Spanish uh, Iberian Peninsula from Arabs 
and they uh, that year they uh, they took Grenadian Emirate where there were a lot of Arabic and Jewish rich people and they got all this money and they ruined all the stuff and these were money that they started using in their next endeavors and actually Arab and Jewish money created a new Christian power. <laughs> it's, it's ironic, but that's how uh, sometimes history is being done. Then some scientific inventions. Newton created his famous laws and Newton's mechanics, and it changed the attitude to facts. Before Newton's laws, mostly people believed in, you know, the faith, matter of faith, was much more important than matter of fact. And Newton laws were the first time when we could predict exactly without any divine force that if the ball is in is a point A to now, point A now, to, then he will be it will be in a point B. And we knew 100 percent exactly. And it made people be, uh, people believe in fact very powerful. And when we started believing in facts, we started thinking, you know, in, in this kind of more practical way, and that's how science and industry developed. And that's why England and other northern European countries started you know, proceeding and developing so fast afterwards. Facts and matter of facts became dominating. Uh, in other parts of the world, especially, for example, in the part of the world where men, most of us are from, Eastern Europe or, you know, for example, Asia, People didn't believe in facts long after that. So it took us probably two or three hundred years afterwards. Because, you know, like societies like ours were mainly transcendent and dr driven by, by, you know, irrational things like faith and, and, you know, and some spiritual things. English people became very practical and in a good way cynical much, much earlier. And they started to do doing achieving, uh, achievements in practical in practical fields, mostly because of science. And Newton was the first who, who was the first person who opened this door of matter of fact. Uh, the, the direct cons consequence of that, but I think it's a single and a separate invention was a steam machine of what? Because steam machine of what uh, created modern industry. Manifold time increased labor power used by men and productivity also and reduced cost of productivity and and liberated a great amount of labor force to do the other job, like then to, to, to be peasants in, in the fields. So it created plants, factories, and everything. Actually, the second, the second invention was, which also, like, you know, was a consequence of this scientific, scientific revolution, was electricity. And James Maxwell, a Scottish uh, scientist, a very modest guy, who was thinking, creating, like, you know, working on electricity theoretically, he created his Maxwell laws, which allowed us to, you know, which allowed us to create many, many, many people, many, many things that we see now. Uh, I don't think that LEDs, but probably just our electrical lights or, you know, everything. You know what electricity created. And funny, funny thing is when then these, these laws were discovered and written first in scientific papers. Most scientists didn't accept them well. So it took probably 20 or 30 years before Maxwell theory uh, proved its practical impact, uh, practical value and made all of us using electricity. Uh, three medical inventions happened during these times. First was a very important, and it happened even before, or probably approximately the same time when Newton created it, his laws, and it was uh, invention or creation of the idea of blood circulation. It was made by English scientist Harvey, and he first understood that blood is circulating from arterias to, vein, to, to capillaries and then through veins back. And actually, it's, you, you may ask, why is, why is it so important? It's so important because it gave us idea what really blood is for, for our you know, body. And it also gave us possibility to heal 
um, and cure some diseases and some really bad things with, with our bodies that we couldn't do before. For example, we started, we understood that gangrenas and all, you know, um, blood inflammations, they cause death and they knew how to treat it afterwards much easier. But two inventions, medical inventions that came later in the, in the beginning of the 20th century, they even changed our life much, you know, in a more rapid and more significant way. These are vaccines and antibiotics. The first killed viruses, the second killed bacteria. And if vaccines helped us to stop, you know, epidemics of plague and of uh, uh, Spanish flu, all this, this kind of stuff, um, and it helped in a, in a peaceful life, then antibiotics helped in, in you know, in healing and uh, curing wounded people uh, who were uh, wounded and injured during wars. And they, because, you know, then in First World War, which Americans or Irish or British called Great War, people just died because of inflammation all the time because, you know, they got all these, you know, everything. They got, you know, pneumonia, they got, like, you know, serious injuries, nobody could, 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 could cure that. But after antibiotics uh, and vaccines were created, were invented, uh, the expect life expectancy raised twice. So at the beginning of the 20th century, it was 40 years. Now it's 75 or 70, I mean, average in the world. So it's almost twice. twice. And I think these two inventions uh, probably made a major, major contribution to this fact. Uh, if we talk about later 20th century inventions, it's long distance connections, telegraph, telephone, and radio. It's actually one invention. We don't need to say that it's three of them. It created mass culture. It created possibility to, it first, it, it, made, it made world flatter, even before internet. It, it didn't make world flat, but it made it flatter. And it was the first step in, in, the, in the whole bunch of inventions that were coming later. But many things, like radio created pop music, radio created uh, uh, first political debates, radio created, like, you know, telephone connect, connected all people and relatives, and it changed already, uh, you know, the... Um, they changed, uh, how to say this? Uh, no, 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 perception. I mean, they, they changed the way that we treated each other, friends and families. For example, you ha if you have your phone, you don't need to see your parents every day or every week. You just call them. And then that somehow alienates us. And that's, that's not a good thing, but that's something that telephone and other, you know, long distance connection created. We started changing our you know, behavior, everyday behavior. Quantum mechanics, uh, which actually probably some of you know, um, quantum mechanics was created by very young scientists of age from 20 to 25 at the turn of the 20th century. And quantum mechanics make, made the job of all of you possible. If not that, I think there will be no computers, no internet, no Google, no, this room, nothing. Because that where everything started. Uh, three or four young scientists in Germany, England, and Austria were so dare they, to say that all the science they knew before was completely bullshit, and they, they, it, didn't, it didn't describe the, the world of atoms, atoms, molecules, and electrons, and particles. So they created this new science which actually also is a very important cornerstone of civilization of, of uh, human beings because it needs changing of our perception of, it, 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 it changed our perception of what is matter of fact. Because quantum mechanics is actually something we cannot understand by our brain. If some of you, many of you understand what I'm talking about, some of you probably don't, I'll explain. Quantum mechanics says that Particle, let's say electron, 
can, if you see a big, big house with 10 entrances, so electron enter all these entrances simultaneously, being not being, you know, uh, divided into parts, being as a whole, and you can find it in each of these entrances at the same time, and it will be there. So we cannot understand that. I mean, our brain is not quantum, is classical. So we cannot understand how does it, how ca can it be possible that one particle can be present at the same moment of time, not being divided in 10 entrances, and it can enter these entrances, like it's, and there's still one particle. But the truth is that that's how the world works. So it, it, it requires from us not to be, not to understand, but to believe in power of facts, to believe in experiments more than in our analytical skills. And that's something that changed the science at all. Because before that, uh, before that, what we did was we first made experiment, then we started to understand that, and then we started, okay, if our understanding corresponds with the experiment, okay, that's a good explanation. But quantum mechanics was the first time when the, we believe in experiment, even if we don't understand how that works. And that's, that's, that's a very important thing, because like, the, the fact and the power of fact rules now our brains. Before that, our brains ruled everything. That's why we saw that the world was flat and we couldn't believe that, that, the, that uh, our globe was round and that uh, we, were, we couldn't believe that we were, you know, our Earth, Earth was rotating around the sun. We, we, we were, you know, we, we thought it was vice versa because that was our brain or our analytical skills told us. But the quantum mechanics changed it completely. And uh, suddenly, after quantum mechanics, a couple of inventions that we see now were, became possible. Television, television, actually, the biggest impact television had was, in my opinion, it was not a pop culture, but it was politics. Because politics created new politicians, created much bigger populism, and you know, when we, when we now you know, uh, regret and we regret about the times um, uh, when we had a big political leaders and now we have just you know, mediocre politicians, uh, one of the things is television. Because television gave politicians possibility to not to talk person to person, but then just to make, to make one appearance, to say some primitive things, but to be very energetic and to be very, you know, persuasive, and people started believing in that. And that's how populism was, you know, was present in the world before, way, way long before television. But television made it, you know, an absolution. <laughs> and then, Atomic energy, it's the third revolution in energy after steam and electricity. I, I don't need to say about good and bad impacts of that. Chernobyl and Hiroshima are one of bad impacts, but there are some also good, because it gives us a, a great amount of energy. And the last three inventions, 18, 19, and 20, I even will not explain it to you, because you will explain much more. You know better about these three inventions, it's computer, it's internet, and it's social networks. The one thing I can say that I, I separate all of them because I don't think that they are three, they are dependent, but they are, they are still separate. Because computer is something that makes us powerful in counting, in, you know, in uh, finding solutions. Uh, internet is, something that changes our, it's something like, you know, like writing was created, cr when, when, when writing was created, the information we had before became useless and we started using information in a different way. Internet, it's a, the other revolution. Uh, I know that now all of you are thinking about today's knowledge and education and we understand that after internet, 
the, for, the, the whole bunch of education that we had before is useless. I mean, what Google made now makes 70% of what is taught in, school, in schools absolutely not necessary. We need to change everything. And countries like, like Canada, like Ireland, I know, like Finland, South Korea, Israel, already has changed a lot of education of children. We in Ukraine, for example, in Eastern Europe still need to, you know, to come closer. And there, was, there is one questionable invention that I don't include in what, top 20, because I think that is still this invention or innovation still hasn't changed mankind. But I do believe that it will. And it's probably the question, what's next? In my point of view, it's, uh, I would call it, neuroscience and artificial intelligence. We still don't know how this will, these two fields will impact human being. We already see some things, but it's only the beginning. I really think that it will be a fundamental change. Both artificial intelligence and uh, the way uh, of our altering and changing our brains. It will create some unbelievable stuff we cannot imagine. I just believe it will, it will come very soon, probably in, in one or two generations. I think most of you will witness it, and then we'll see how serious was it, and will it be something uh, you know, comparable to hot food or not? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Slava. Actually, I'm really happy that I heard your uh, lecture today because uh, you, as a creative person and a person who sees things differently, gave me a little bit of interesting perspective about many things today. Thank you. And we are mostly engineers here, so you know we are very focused on engineering things, and this was much wider than I actually personally expected, so I'm very happy to be here. We still have probably two minutes for questions. And please... Only if, two minutes? Uh, well, four, but we still need to... It's, uh, it's the end. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Um, you, should, you should have stopped me earlier. But so we, we I, was so, I was so happy about what you talk, were talking about, I didn't want to stop you. Don't worry about this, it's can fine. We have, can we have like 10, 15 minutes? Because I'm like struggling to get some questions. I came here to uh, hear people uh, Actually, well. we need to ask our engineers if they will allow us to do it. Yeah, thank minutes. you very much. Excellent. Appreciate it, mate. So, we have, we have more time for questions, excellent. So, uh, guys, if you have any questions from audience, I will... Do it like this. From what we heard or, or something completely different, yeah, don't, don't, don't hesitate. Just don't please be political. It's very important. But everything else is fine. Hello. Hello. Slava, thank you. It's great to see you. And thank I'll you. be quick with my question. Um, if you think of, a, you know, first, first of all, people know you through music, right? So let's call you a rock star in a sense. But a stereotypical, a, sense. <laughs> a stereotypical rock star would be doing a lot of music and let's say drugs. Whereas you, for example, do a lot of music. I did beer yesterday. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you do a lot of music and science and social and all of this. So my question is, where do you get the energy and inspiration? How do you manage to maintain this inspiration to keep doing all of that? It, it depends on who you ask. People who believe in quantum mechanics or people who believe in God. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, actually, I believe in God. And I think these two correspond very well. And. Uh, I think that energy comes from, from, from God. And God is not in a religion way, but it's some, something big in the world that you can concentrate on and you have this channel of interaction. And I know that I sometimes I have this energy and I don't know where it comes from, especially when you have five concerts in a row and at the end of the five concerts you're still you know, jumping and singing energetically. I don't know, it's, it's, it's not my you know, my credit. It's somebody there. Okay, so I, I see one person. I never Whoa. was good at games, but well, sorry. It, it looks nice. It's actually a very good thing, I like it. Hello, Slava. Thank Hello. you so much for coming to us, and it's Thank a you. great honor to have you here. My question would be about your travel, about your world tours. Uh, you meet a lot of Ukrainians who live abroad, and what would be kind of three main differences with those people who live in country? Like if you meet diaspora Ukrainians, 
what would be the difference in the way they would be thinking and you mean comparable to Ukraine yeah comparing to those people who live in Ukraine comparing to Ukraine mm. you know I will say only one and that makes I think it is something optimistic you know in our country we always uh, complain on how Ukrainians are not effective, they cannot create a proper institution, they are not people who, who can, like, you know, who, who stick into some laws, sometimes not very hardworking. That's something we're complaining about in comparison to other countries. But when I see Ukrainians in other countries, I see them among most, you know, like, you know, industrious, hardworking, like, successful, and also, you know, like, you know, some of the most successful people in the world. That ma brings me to the idea that that's institutions and, you know, environment that matters most. And Ukrainians are like people who in the world make difference. So the, the, the one thing we need to do in Ukraine to create these institutions and that environment that you have in these countries. So that's what we need to do. And there's no other difference. Thanks. Um, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, That's really ridiculous. <laughs> hi, Slava. Uh, you briefly touched on the subject of education and how it needs to change. And I know your dad was very passionate about education system and change, and I know was the witness of it. So I, my question is, how would you like to see the education system develop and progress into 21st century? And what changes would you like to see first? Thank you. In my opinion, the most important today is not to give an information to children, which you already here in Google are doing. So probably you can have one or two rivalries, which I think is always good for, for competition and for quality. You still don't have. So. But uh, that's something we need to leave behind. What we need to do is to to teach children how to live lives, how to live. That is how to be a personality, how to analyze, how to percept, how to perceive, how to get and how to give. These things that many thousand years were like, you know, abandoned, now little by little are starting to come closer and in some uh, education system, they already dominate. In the best university in the world, that's what they teach students now. But in some countries, we still in this, I wouldn't say in, in uh, ice age but, or stone age, but, but you know, it's still a lot of things to be done. So I believe we need to come to shift our focus from, from information to a personality. Oh, you can throw it. It's, it's throwable. It's like yeah. like, a, like a game. Throw it. It's fine. Throw it. Throw it. Don't worry about this. Hi, Slava. Just a quick question that you mentioned that the invention of money made us a bit more uh, cautious. For instance, se several of the things you mentioned are about creating narratives and new narratives and how we should believe stuff that we haven't believed before. Considering that, especially in the West you're getting more and more constrained by economics, economic circumstances by the time you get to the age of 20 and 30. How do you see that tension between material um, safety and the need to challenge the status quo playing out for our own generation afterwards? Do, would you have enough, you know, would people have enough freedom to actually create a new narrative without fearing for their material uh, well-being? That's a good question. And uh, what we are facing now is actually the struggle between our fears and our desires. Because uh, we see it in Western Europe, probably Western Europe and Northern America are pioneers in this new you know, kind of environment we are going to live some period of time. I don't have any, an answer uh, with, about you know, what will be the end or consequence or impact of that. I don't have it. I just know that somehow 
people during the last 30,000 years of their history were managed to create a proper way to handle it. Sometimes this, this is not probably the best way you could find better, but it's still, you know, as, as a river or a small, small creek, it somehow finds its path. And I think that I believe that European, and generally, not only European, but human beings, civilization will find its path. The, 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 the side effect of, of civilization is that it, it makes us more anxious and make us more stressed. And if the biggest problem of, of uh, our you know, ancestors in Stone Age was a fear to get eaten by a lion, if the big, biggest fear if our middle age colleagues was to get sick and die from plague, so now our biggest fear is our stress and our anxiety. And uh, more and more people go crazy about that, sometimes literally, but mostly figuratively. And it changes our everyday life, and we become less and less happy. You, you mean we need to understand that to be happy, you don't need to have a big mansion in London or a private jet or even a good computer or even a great job or gets good salary or even your family. That's only some, the, what makes you happy is yourself. It's your perception in your brain, in your soul. So there are some people who are happy to, to have 10 children and be happy fathers and mothers. There are people who are happy to travel to the end of their lives and not have families. There are people who want to have money and they're really happy to have money. There are people who don't care. But our nowadays, you know, narrative gives less freedom. All of us are forced to live the same lives. Here is one, you need to have a good salary, you have to have wife and children or husband and children. You need to be, you know, you know, treated correctly by society, you need to behave this way, you, don't, you, you cannot live in the forest, you cannot do that. But people who lived three, four hundred years ago, or thousands of years ago, sometimes they suffered more. But were they less happy, or are we more happy? I don't think so. There are some people who, who have serious diseases who are happier than healthy people. So happiness, I think, is much more important for us than a development. So we need to focus on happiness. Uh, last, la, la, last row. Well, last, let, no, no, last three throws because it's always like that. Last three questions. One, two, and there was three. Yeah. yeah. Um, hi. Um, hi. Um, it's actually a pleasure to see you here. Been a fan of yours since I was 11. I have a um, quick question. So, um, because you're a rock star, you're kind of traveling around the world and see loads of countries. The first question is, what's your favorite country? And second, would you ever consider to move abroad and leave To abroad? Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> is it, an, this is not a political question. No, it's not a political question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I cannot say which country is my favorite country, because I've been to so many countries that many of them has things that I love. Uh, I would say my last love is Australia. Because <laughs> we, we, we went to Australia this year, and I think Melbourne was a city that most of our team and crew fell in love with immediately. Uh, the only bad thing, the probably also good thing, there is it's very far. And uh, I think the bad things makes good things. Good, because people are, I think that that was the the, the, the country when I met the big, the mo like how you say I met I met uh, more happy people than any other in any other place in the world. Australia is my let's let's say it's present number one in my chart. But you know chart always changes. You know so probably Ireland will be one day. But I will say exactly that from the point of view of Pub life, Ireland is so far number one. What we've seen yesterday, me and Vlada and Julia, we haven't seen anywhere in the world. I mean, 
Like we, we popped in three bars just to see. And in each of them, we saw like crazy parties singing and doing, you know, I can't imagine it, not only in Ukraine, but I can't imagine it in America, in, in the UK. You can see it only in Ireland, I think. It's unbelievable how people were partying. <laughs> Maybe you should stay a bit longer, you know. Sorry? Like, maybe you should stay a bit longer and go to If I were, clubs. if my favorite thing was partying, that I probably would do that, but no, <laughs> <laughs> it's not. <laughs> Two and three. Let's throw it. Poo. Do you want practice in basketball? I used to play basketball, I can teach you. Okay, I should have played more. Um, thanks, Slava, for the talk. I've been to a concert a long time ago in Simferopol, mm -hmm. and um, so I have a question, I have two questions, you can either answer both or choose one of them. Uh, first question, what are the plans for your band, for Akian Elsie? And second one, what's your opinion now about uh, Ukrainian music? Our plans for Akian Elsie, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't in, I didn't intend to, to talk about that in the nearest month, so we wanted to make a proper press conference and to say something, but I will, okay, give us a I will, I will, I will uh, you know, throw some light into that. Um, after we finish with this tour, which is the end of June, we'll make a break and we don't know what will be next. We don't have any specific plans, so we really don't know when will be next concerts, next tour, next album. We want to recuperate and to relax and just to think. And I wish we come back as soon as possible, but I don't know. It can be a year, it can be two, it can be five. Nobody knows. So that's something where we still don't have, the question is open. Ukrainian music, Ukrainian music is unbelievable, is booming now. I think that pro probably it's one of the best periods of Ukrainian music I've seen. So many great bands and musicians, some of them are still under, in the underground, some of them are known already, but it's, it's great. I'm looking forward to seeing the next generation of Ukrainian musicians becoming as popular as a canal or even bigger. Okay, and the last question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, like this. <coughs> Excellent. Good shot. Uh, hi, Slava. Um, hi. I want to finish on the question that is actually more related to innovations, and you kind of talked about artificial intelligence and how important it's going to be in the future. Obviously, it's going to help us solve like simple um, problems, but what about music and art? Do you think it will overtake the human or what's the value of like artificially created music and art going to be? I don't know exactly. I don't know because you come to a very important philosophic question. Is art a, a brain creation or is art a what we call soul creation? As a materialist, we understand that soul is a rather abstract thing. Although some people can say that you can derive it from our, you know, you know, neural system, from serotonin and dopamine and all the things. But I don't know. From what I've seen from the first, first att attempts to do artificial music, it sounds clumsy and awkward. But it's only, only the beginning. You know, so probably one day we'll start crying and we got goosebumps from music or art that robot creates, created. I don't know. You want me, my, fav my fair answer, what's, what I want to, to see. I'm a human being nationalist, you know. So I, I prefer that human beings create human stuff and robot create everything else. But I'm not sure that will be like that. I don't know. Okay. So thank you very thank much, you. guys. Thank you. Thank you.